Welcome to Lion's Den. I'm Maureen Lyons, and today I'm borrowing more storytellers from Moose, which is the main organization of storytelling enthusiasts. We've heard historical folklore, we've heard war stories, and have had some comical characters here. These ladies today are going to tell us children's stories both involving animals. So I want to introduce Susan Drees Hi. to my left from Wyndham Hi. and Lynn Cullen from Portland. Um, you trained in England yep. where there's storytelling clubs? Yeah, there are here as well. Uh, but um, uh, I was living in England in uh, 1998 and I was looking for a job and you know had, hadn't been there very long and then I saw something in the paper storytelling and, and even though it had been going on in the States for a while too I didn't know anything about it and I um, went to this it was this gorgeous old pub called the Brokers Arms what a name. <laughs> I don't know what it means and uh, and there were people telling you know folk tales and fairy tales from Ireland and what have you and it was all you know adults and we're having pints of beer and and as soon as I knew of its existence I couldn't wait to do it myself. I thought, I didn't know people were doing this. And during the open mic session, uh, I immediately got up, and I didn't have anything in my head except a, uh, I'd tell it to you now, but it's a mildly off-color joke, <laughs> but a great story. And there were a bunch of bored young men there that their girlfriends had dragged them to, and it was the only time I saw them suddenly start to enjoy themselves. But everyone loved the folk tales, including me. And uh, ever since then, I've been doing it. And uh, uh, I might add that uh, I know you said children's stories, but uh, I don't believe that the Brothers Grimm stories, one of which I'm telling, are for children. And I rarely tell for children, but, uh, you know, children can like them if they want to. <laughs> well, you and I talked about um, the new edition, well, a new book on Grimm's fairy tales yes. where the man named Philip Pullman, he puts the dark parts of those stories back in because... At some point, they were sanitized yeah, after he, they were written, to, you he know. He doesn't really put them back in. I mean, he tells them, he doesn't rework them in any major way. He, he takes them from various volumes or, you know, editions of the Brothers Grimm. And then, you know, like any storyteller, because all those stories really, even though they've been preserved for us thanks to publishing, they're really meant to be oral, and so you can change them. And so he adds just enough of Phil, Philip Pullman, you know, in his own words. Uh, but what he did was the ones he collected in the book, his book of Brothers Grimm's stories, uh, he leaned towards the darker ones. Mm. The one I'm going to tell isn't, isn't very dark. It's very absurdist. <laughs> and this is the 200th year anniversary of the Grimm's fairy tales. 2012, yes, the, yeah. of the first edition of Grimm's fairy tales. And so I'm going to tell a story from the Brothers Grimm called Hans, My Hedgehog. And uh, I guess I'll begin with, it'll be like a movie. We'll have an overture. a very wealthy farmer, and he had everything that a wealthy farmer could ever want except for one thing. He and his wife had never had any children. And every time this farmer went to the fair, all his neighbors would rib him, and they'd say things like, well, why can't you do what your cattle does every day? And one day he came back from the fair in a foul mood, and he swore, and he said, by God, I'm going to have a child, if, even if it turns out to be a hedgehog. 
Not long after that, to the surprise of both he and his wife, his wife became pregnant. And in time, she gave birth, and it came out legs first, and there were the little pink legs, and from the waist up, it was a hedgehog. This is all your fault, said his wife. Now what are we going to do? Yeah, my goodness, said the farmer, and who will be godfather to this, and, and what will we christen him? Well, there's only one thing we can call him, said the farmer's wife. Hans, my hedgehog. And that was his name. But then they began to worry about where Hans, my hedgehog, was going to sleep because all the prickles on a hedgehog would tear up any bed. And so the farmer decided to throw some straw behind the stove. And he placed Hans, my hedgehog, there. And that's where he remained for the next eight years. And every now and then, the farmer would walk by the stove and he would find himself wishing that Hans, my hedgehog, was dead. But time passed, and one day the farmer was going to the market, and he asked his wife if she'd like him to bring back anything, and she said, yes, a small piece of steak and a half dozen rolls. And he asked the maidservant, what would she like? And she said, oh, some stockings and, and some slippers. And he asked his son, and Hans, my hedgehog, said, just bring me a set of bagpipes, father. And off the farmer went to the fair. And when he came back, he gave his wife what she'd asked for and the maidservant. And as soon as he handed the bagpipes to Hans, my hedgehog, he said, Father, if you will do one more thing for me, I'll be out of your hair forever. Please make a pair of shoes for the cockerel, that is a rooster, out in the yard. And I'll be out of your way. And so the father thought this was a great bargain and he'd be rid of this embarrassing son. And so he had these shoes made and as soon as the shoes were on the feet of the cockerel, Hans, my hedgehog, picked up his bagpipes and jumped on the back of the cockerel and off he rode into the forest. And when Hans found a place he liked, he spurred the cockerel and it flew up into the tree. And Hans picked up his bagpipes and he sat on the branches playing away and learning how to play. And he became very good as the years passed, and after 10 years had passed, he was playing quite beautifully. Now one day, a king rode into the forest with his entire retinue, and they were on their way from some grand ball or whatever, and they got hopelessly lost. And the king was worried, but then he heard some lovely bagpipe music. <laughs> And he sent a servant to go see who was playing. And the servant looked around, and then finally he looked up, and there he saw this hedgehog with the cockerel playing the bagpipes up in the tree. And he said, would you come down, please? Why should I, said Hans. And the fellow said, my king wishes to speak to you. All right. So Hans jumped down from the tree, and before long he was standing in front of the king. Can you lead us out of this forest, asked the king. I can, said Hans, on one condition. You must promise me in writing to give to me the very first creature that comes to greet you when you return to your palace. Done, said the king. Now the king had no intention of honoring this promise. He figured this monster couldn't read or write, and he scribbled any old thing on the paper in his best kind of pharmacist handwriting, and he handed it to Hans, my hedgehog, and Hans soon led him out of the forest. Now this king had a daughter, a beautiful princess, and when she saw her father and his company arriving, she was the first one out the palace gates to greet him. But the king wasn't worried at all. And when he told her the story of what had happened, they both had a good laugh about it and how they'd tricked this strange creature. I, I would never marry a, a hedgehog, even if you tried to make me father. <laughs> what a good joke. Now, meanwhile, another king with another retinue got lost in the forest. The forest back in those days were vast, and it was easy to lose your way. And again, he heard the plane, and he sent a servant to go see, and there was Hans, my hedgehog, playing away up in the tree. And he asked him to come down, and once again, Hans stood before this king. And the king said, can you lead me out of the forest? And he said, certainly, if you promise me in writing to give to me the first creature that comes to greet you when you go home. Done, said the king, and this was an honorable king, and he wrote down a promissory note, and he signed it with, with his seal and gave it to Hans, and Hans, my hedgehog, led them all out of the forest. 
Now, this king also had a daughter, a beautiful princess, and she was anxious because her father was late, and when she saw him on his way to the palace, she was the first one out the gate to greet him, and her father said, Oh, I am so sorry, my darling. But why? And he told her the whole story. But she said, Father, a king's word is sacred, and his word is his bond, and if you have promised that I should marry this hedgehog, I will, no matter what he looks like should he ever show up. And that was that. Meanwhile, back in the forest, Hans was sitting up in the tree, playing, and tending his pigs, because he had brought a few pigs from his father's farm with him. And as he played and sat there, and time went by, the pigs had more pigs, and those pigs had more pigs, and those pigs had pigs, until there were so many pigs, they filled up the forest from one end to the other. And Hans decided, you know, he'd done the forest. It was time to move on to something else. So he had a message sent to his father, who hadn't seen him in some years, telling him to empty every pigsty in the village because he was bringing enough pigs to last for months and months and more. Now, the father, the farmer, was none too happy to hear, get a note from Hans my Hedgehog because he thought maybe the son was long dead. But at the prospect of all these pigs, he did what his son asked. And before long, along came Hans my Hedgehog on his cockerel with all these pigs driven before him. And the slaughter and the feast in that village could be heard and smelled for miles around and for days afterwards. And once more, Hans asked his father, please, if you would make a nice new pair of shoes for my cockerel, I'll be out of your hair. So the father did this. and. Off rode Hans to the palace of the first king. Now this king, he didn't know if he'd ever see Hans, but he had given strict orders that if anybody should see a bagpipe playing hedgehog riding on the back of a cockerel, he was to be shot, stabbed, punched, blown up, anything to keep him from entering the palace gates. And so when word got to the king, he sent out his grenadiers, and they had their bayonets at the ready. But all Hans, my hedgehog, did was spur his cockerel, and it flew up until it perched on the palace walls. And then he called out in a loud voice, O oh, king, it is time to honor your end of the bargain. And if you don't, it will go the worse for you. Well, the king knew he was busted. So, he hastily got together a carriage, and his daughter got on her best white dress, and he gathered up a bunch of wagons full of treasure and gold and deeds for tracts of land, and Hans got into the carriage with his cockerel and the bride and his bagpipes, and off they went, and the king was certain he'd never see his daughter again. But he was wrong, because as soon as the carriage was out of sight of the palace, Hans, my hedgehog, called everything to a halt. And he opened the carriage door and ordered the girl to get out. And then he swiped at her with his prickles until her beautiful dress was torn to shreds and she was covered with scratches. And then he sent her and the carriage and all the goods back to her father, and the two of them were never trusted by anybody again. And that was that for them. And now Hans, my hedgehog, rode off to the second palace. And this king had given word that if anybody were to see a hedgehog riding a cockerel playing the bagpipes coming to the palace, he was to be given a parade, slapped on the back, given a meal, three cheers, and brought right to him. And now the girl had promised the king's daughter to marry this hedgehog, but when she got a look at him, well, she was pretty appalled, but she had given her word. And soon the wedding took place, and he sat right beside his bride at the banquet, and then they went up to bed. And he could see that the girl was terrified of all his prickles. And he, he said to her, please, my darling, I love you. And I would do anything at all to make you happy. And so he called to her father, the king. And there was a great fireplace in the hall landing outside their bedchamber. And he asked him to get four servants to make a great big roaring hot fire in there. And he told the servants, that as soon as he removed his prickles, they were to come in and grab it and throw it into the fire until it was burned to ash. And so he stood in front of his bride, and he began to unzip his skin. He pulled it off, prickles and all, and threw it on the floor and went and lay on the wedding bed. 
And the servants, as soon as they heard the sound of the prickle striking the floor, they rushed in, took it out, threw it into the fire, and watched it until it burned down to ash. And the moment the last bit of it was ashes, Hans, my hedgehog, was free. And he lay in the bed like a real man, except his skin was all black and charred as though he himself had been lying in the fire. But the king was ready for that, and he brought his healers and his doctors with their potions and ointments and unguents and bas you know, bactine and whatever. And, and in no time at all, his Hans, my hedgehog's skin was nice and smooth and white, and he was an ordinary man, although much more handsome than most. And the wedding night was everything one would hope it would be. And then they had a grand wedding breakfast, and they were all so happy, they had a second wedding banquet. And things went very well for Hans, and in the course of time, he succeeded the old king and became king in his turn. And a few years went by, and he took his queen on a trip to the village where he was born. And they went to the farmhouse he was born in, and they knocked on his father's door, and the old man answered. Hello? He saw this grand person. Father, it is me, Hans, your son. No, no, no. My son went off to see the world many years ago, and, and he's never come back, and he never looked like you. But as soon as Hans picked up his bagpipes and began to play, <laughs> father burst into tears of joy, which is surprising for all he, as nice as he'd been before, but he welcomed his son and they took the old man to the palace and all of them lived happily ever after. And that's the story of Hans my Hedgehog. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you. That's cool. You're also a playwright. Yes, um, I've had uh, several plays have been in the short plays, the main short play festival that's held every year in Portland, put on by Acorn, and I've written some full-length plays, and uh, slowly I think they begin to interact a little bit. I, I think some kind of folk themes leak into the plays and vice versa. But they're not fairy tales or... No, I've done one or two takes on fairy tales and plays, but mostly they're real world. Um, uh, I did one that I got a main arts grant for a few years ago, a full-length play called The Amazing Life and Mysterious End of Ragana, Mistress of Illusion, and it's about a female magician in the 20s. And so it does have some hints of folklore, but it's a, more like a film noir, uh, mm. kind of an adventurous tale. Um, and... Uh, it's interesting because uh, there's a storytelling and theater and literature all have common elements, but uh, it's a really different challenge with playwriting because mm -hmm. with the storyteller you have you and the listener and their imagination, whereas with theater you have it a script and you have your, the the viewer is seeing things where the storyteller has to evoke that mm. in the listener's head. So. Uh, it's, it's a different way of thinking about things. And tell me about your Shanaki Nights, Shanaki Nights. Uh, once a month in Portland. That's right. Uh, the third Monday of every month, um, I do uh, music and stories, uh, from traditional, uh, from the British Isles, Ireland, and, and other, other, you know, some historical tales as well. And we meet uh, in Bullfinis. They have a beautiful upstairs room. It's circular with a little stage. And... It's very festive. You can have drinks and food, and uh, we'll be meeting there. Um, I've been doing it for, this is the sixth year. Oh. I started it up there six years ago, and I'm kind of a, it's just me out of pocket kind of getting the storytellers in, and we kind of split up the door in various ways. And, and it's a great evening, and we'll be doing our annual solstice show on uh, December the, I think it's the 17th, with Sebastian Lockwood reading from uh, A Child's Christmas in Wales, and Oh, I'm going to yeah. be doing some folk tales from North America, and we'll have fiddle and concertina, so oh. it's good fun. And it's done kind of after the English model, um, although there's no open mic, just 90 minutes of stories and music. So the clubs that, that you belong to in England are similar to that? 
Yeah, there are similar clubs in America too, but the difference is uh, most of the clubs in the state seem to have an open mic followed by the feature. Whereas in England, you get um, a 90 minute feature first, and they usually start later, about 8 o'clock. And they're nine times out of 10, they're in some kind of a pub. Uh, you know, because pubs are such old buildings and they have all mm. sorts of nice little extra rooms. And then after the feature, they'll be, you know, from maybe 10 to 11, what they call stories from the floor in England, open mic, and people can get up and tell. So uh, I've done it that way with a longer time for the feature, but I've left out the open mic. There's just not enough time where I am. Mm. It's, yeah. And it's Monday night. Or, yeah. <laughs> And thank you, thank you Susan us. Dries and Lynn Cullen. Thank you. And I think that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Certainly enjoyed the concertina. Yes, that was nice. Thank <laughs> you, Maureen Lyons from Lions Den.